Thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll move around. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Um, I just want to start off. Thanks for listing all the all the different bits and pieces. It sounds like a lot when I when I hear it. Um, doesn't seem like so much when it's on a slide. I'm not sure if anybody's aware, but there's quite a lot of hype at the moment around psychedelics. If you're here, you're probably already aware of that though. Um, but this hype is, is getting fever pitch to the point where there are corporations now, psychedelic corporations. So many psychedelic corporations that like the ASX 500 or the All Wars, you can follow the psychedelics index to see how the price of the shares are going in all of these different psychedelic corporations. Now, I'm a psychologist, not a financial advisor, but I wouldn't recommend investing in this at the moment because there is a lot of hype and these, these, these drugs are not going to cure all of the problems we have in society. They're not a silver bullet for, for you know, mental, mental illness. Um, that's certainly helpful for some people. And so I think there's a bit of a bubble that's going to burst soon. So yeah, as a psychologist, not financial advisor, probably recommend investing. So how do we get to this point where there is so much hype about psychedelics. So we've got a psychedelics index like the ASX 500. Well, as a psychologist, I know the best way to predict future behaviour is to look at past behaviour. So going back through history. And I, I titled the presentation as Psychedelic Renaissance Question Mark. And the reason for that is that people have been using psychedelic drugs for a long time. For thousands of years, in different indigenous cultures, people have experimented with the use of various plants as medicines to or, or to facilitate um, engagement in their spiritual practices. And so the idea that this is a renaissance, maybe it's a third way, this is really the third way of psychedelic research because the first way was happening long before it was even part of the Western conscious. So how did how did how did psychedelics become become integrated? How did, how did the Western culture become aware of psychedelics? Well, mescaline was, was in, isolated in the ninth, late 19th century, which is uh, the key ingredient from peyote cactus, but that didn't really change a lot in terms of it changing the zeitgeist. What really happened in terms of the change and it entering Western culture was 1943, when Albert Hoffman was working on developing new medications that he was hoping would treat migraine. And one day he was accidentally exposed to one of these medications. He didn't feel so well, so he went home. He wasn't 100% sure what he was exposed to, but he had a pretty good idea of what it was. So three days later, he went back to the lab and intentionally ingested 250 micrograms of the said medication. Of course, the said medication was LSD. We know that 250 micrograms is a pretty solid dose of LSD. He realised that the lab was not the best place to be, and so he hopped on his bike and pedaled home. And because, you know, in those days, 250 micrograms was a minute dose. People were taking medication in, in milligram ranges. People didn't take it in microgram ranges. This was an extremely powerful drug. And on his ride home, he described the beauty he saw in nature, um, how vivid the colours were, and he went on to self-experiment with LSD and recognised that it had these profound effects, but he couldn't figure out what they might be used for, how might they be useful. So Sandoz, the lab that he was working for, sent it out to researchers around the world to try and figure out what it could be used for. So they started off giving it to people with schizophrenia. That didn't work so well. <laughs> I'm not sure what the rationale was, but it didn't go so well. Um, at that time, in the, in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, these drugs were called psychomimetics because <clears throat> they produced an effect that people believed mimicked psychosis. So they started to give it to psychiatrists to help psychiatrists develop empathy for their patients with schizophrenia. <laughs> and Philosoph philosophers started taking it to you know, en enhance their mental state and come up with new ideas. And probably the most well-known philosopher um, who's written about psychedelics was, was Huxley. So Aldous Huxley engaged with Dr. Hum Humphrey Osmond, um, who was a psychiatrist overseeing LSD-assisted 
um, psychotherapy for alcohol use disorder, and he gave uh, Huxley a dose of mescaline in May 1953, and Huxley had a, a profound experience to write about this in a book called Doors of Deception, which is a tribute to William Blake's poem from the 19th century, in which William Blake stated, it's a doors of perception with the lens, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up, till he sees all things through narrow chinks in his cavern. Huxley then encouraged other academics to try these psychedelic compounds. And of course, at this time, they were called psychomimetics. The word psychedelic hadn't been invented, if you like. And so, um, Huxley continued to correspond with uh, Dr. Osman, and he wrote to uh, Dr. Osman saying, To make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of to mine, which means spiritness in ancient Greek. Osman countered with, To fathom hell or soar angelic, <clears throat> to fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of a psychedelic. Psychedelic therapy emerged, and by the 1970s there had been over a thousand papers published on LSD, um, psychotherapy for alcohol use dependence, um, it was being used to treat existential, existential angst among the terminally ill. Uh, two different types of psychotherapy emerged, psychedelic therapy in the US where people were given large doses that were intended to induce mystical states or profound states, whereas in Europe, they were using psycholytic therapy, which is just to lower doses to loosen the mind. It wasn't microdose, it was more of a lower dose for the treatment of neurosis, psychosomatic disorders. And so, you know, this basically this, this research that, that occurred during this period of time, <coughs> thousand papers, 10,000 patients, showing that these, this treatment of the LSD or psilocybin assisted psychotherapy could be effective for, for any one of these um, one of these conditions. And it was found to produce profound, rapid, long-lasting positive effects with little need for further investigation, unlike psychoanalysis, which involved years and years of, of treatment. So one of the researchers that was involved backwards, one of the researchers that was involved in psychedelic psychotherapy was uh, Dr. Timothy Leary, Leary, Professor of Psychology at Harvard University. So Leary um, did some great work. He was uh, one of the supervisors of the Panky study, the Good Friday study with theologians in a randomized controlled trial we're given psilocybin on Good Friday, the timing given today's Good Thursday. But, Levy's methodology started to get loose, his patients were sleeping on his, on his couch in his house, and then near the end, you know, he was pretty much willing to give LSD, or not willing, wanting to give LSD to anybody that would take it. And so he was fired from Harvard University. But by this stage, the Cultural Revolution had already started. Young Americans were taking LSD en masse, and Leary became their figurehead. He was seen on national TV telling the young people to tune in, to, to turn on, tune in, drop out. And this was not a good time for a cultural revolution because the US was at war with Vietnam. And the authorities noticed that people that took LSD didn't want to go to Vietnam and shoot other people. They saw this as a problem. They saw LSD as a threat to the very American institution. And so LSD was banned in the US in 1968. It was essentially the start of the war on drugs in terms of the rhetorical word use of the word. I mean, prohibition started earlier in the US, but the, the idea of this war on drugs started uh, you know, in the late, the late 60s, early 70s. By international ratification of the UN Convention in 1971, psychedelic drugs became illegal internationally. And as a consequence of this, um, it led to the end of psychedelic science. It was too hard to conduct. In addition to uh, the end of psychedelic science, it also led to lots of powerful myths with regard to 
LSD and other psychedelics. So, for example, there's the myth that LSD might contain strychnine, and this is taken from the, the DSM published in, in the year 2000. The DSM, where it says that one of the risks of taking LSD is, is strychnine poisoning, no, no citation, no reference is provided. And in fact, there's, there's, strychnine has never been detected in LSD. It just shows the power of that propaganda campaign from the 60s and 70s in terms of influencing um, you know, important texts, uh, respected texts such as the DSM. The DSM-5 is now a removed reference to strict iron um, as a risk from taking LSD. There's concerns, there's the myth around chromosomal damage which emerged from a poorly conducted study in 1967 and the results of the study were refuted uh, by two studies conducted later in the 70s but those studies didn't get media traction that the first study did, and so that myth persists to today as well. Alongside that myth is the myth that um, if you take LSD, it's stored in your spinal fluid and it will be released at some point, causing a flashback, which links nicely to the next one that if you take LSD, it will send you insane. And a review of the literature, of all of those clinical trials conducted in the, in the between the 40s through to 1971, found that in less than 0. Point, in less than 0.01 percent of cases, were there, was there any evidence of psychosis in these therapies? Um, and there's further evidence. Okay, continuing, continuing, just to, to demonstrate how powerful this thing is. Um, yesterday, I published a piece on the conversation about microdosing. Um, Princess Gemma responded. Um, not more self <laughs> You've obviously ignored the risk of addiction. Effects of psychedelic drugs on people with mental illness, bringing on neuroticism or overdosing risks. Why not microdose on cow manure and possum droppings? They have similar effects and are natural. Now, I'm not going to go into microdosing because there's a whole other, that's a whole other session in and of itself. But I replied, risk of addiction? Let's everybody say cataphylaxis. Word of the day, I know it's a big word, but it's an important one to understand the following statement. Psychedelics cannot lead to physiological dependence due to tachyphylaxis. Princess Gemma replies, fine, I know what the word means. There is no guarantee everyone will just take small doses. I wish that's the term. <laughs> <laughs> but you haven't addressed other health issues which can happen. But let's just find those facts, shall we? I said, other health issues? Fire away. Vince and I will be happy to respond. She said, you're supposedly a doctor, then you should already know the other health risks that can arise. Numbness, disorientation, and loss of consciousness, hallucinations, increase in blood pressure, stroke, increase in irregular heart rate, and risk of suicide. Maybe do some more research. <laughs> I responded, can you provide any peer-reviewed evidence showing 10 micrograms of LSD leads to any of those symptoms? Maybe you should review the literature before you start firing up on social media and provide a bunch of links, including a link to the safety tolerability and pharmacokinetics of blue doses of LSD provided to geriatrics. That was recently published last year. So you can see how strong these myths are just, just through um, recent interaction on social media. And recent epidemiological data, albeit it's not the best way to gather data, shows that even outside of clinical trials, psychedelics might have positive effects. So in large population-based surveys, they've found lower incidence of mental health disorders among people who have a lifetime history of psychedelic use, lower incidence of suicide attempts, lower incidence of past month psychological distress, and lower incidence of past year suicidal ideation. So, the end of the embargo on psychedelic research really started with Dr. Rick Strassman's work. So, Rick was a psychiatrist who had been trained during the years when psychedelic assisted psychotherapy was actually happening. And he had um, you know, wanted to dream of becoming a psychedelic assisted psychotherapist himself, saw that you know, it got banned, and he wanted to get the research happening again. So, he approached a trusted colleague, one of his mentors, who said, well, why don't you do a trial with dimethyltryptamine? The HREC committee, the ethics committee, won't know what it is. <laughs> and so he did. He got ethics approval to administer dimethyltryptamine to dozens of patients, 
Um, and he was just doing really basic research. He was looking at the floods, he was looking at levels, levels of serotonin, and it was really basic research. And of course, the most interesting research that, that came out of it was not so much the quantitative stuff, but the qualitative analysis then of patients' reports that were administered to dimethyltryptamine, which he wrote up in a book, which is quite separate to the, um, you know, the, the peer reviewed publications that came from this research. But the most important thing about this research is it opened Pandora's box to this so called psychedelic renaissance. So, this is one picture of the number of publications. Uh, published about psilocybin, so you can see, you know, it sort of peaked in the 70s, dropped off, and then there's this increase. So, in preparation for tonight, I thought I would just do my own quick search and continue it on. And you can see from 2004 through to 2020, there's a, there continues to be this exponential increase in publications on psychedelic science. So, what have we learned through all this new research? Well, we've developed an increased understanding of consciousness and the way psychedelics work. But for me, as a clinical psychologist, the most important data that's come from all of this is indications that these might be promising therapies, um, drug-assisted therapies for a range of mental health conditions for which we currently don't have great therapies for, or for which some patients don't respond to the, the therapies that we have. The therapies that we have for some of these conditions work well for some people, but not for others. And for those other people, um, the prognosis is often not great. So in terms of the consciousness aspect and neuroscience, in the 60s, we thought that psychedelics turn on parts of the brain, and that's, that's what led to these visual effects and the um, changes in perception. And what we've now learned is that it's less about turning on parts of the brain and actually turning off a part of the brain from the default mode network. The default mode network is basically an interconnected, uh, it's basically an interconnected um, system of systems within the brain. It's a bit like the brain's conductor. When we're talking to ourselves, um, so when we're sort of thinking, that's the default mode network activated. It's actually, if, I, if my default mode network was not activated now, I would be having trouble having this conversation with you. People with depression and OCD tend to have a hyper-aroused default mode network. And psychedelic drugs tend to turn off the default mode network. So what does that look like? So the brain on the brain on the left is a normal brain, the brain on the right is the brain on psilocybin. So you can see when the default mode network is turned off, there is increased connectivity between, um, between different parts of the brain. By turning the default mode network off, a lot of cross-talk happens because the default mode network is like the conductor of the brain. And if you turn the conductor off, all of a sudden you get a cacophony of noise, but within that cacophony of noise might be some of the subjective effects that include um, uh, you know, big challenging existing beliefs, uh, mystical and spiritual experiences, creativity, um, and, and, and you know, many of the other subjective effects of psychedelics. In terms of psychedelic assisted therapy for depression, this was some, some data from um, an open label trial at Imperial from 2016. It's just recently completed a randomized control trial in which they use this telegram, or they use, it, they use an antidepressant as a control condition and um, psilocybin as the, as, the, as the treatment condition. Interestingly, they, they, they found promising results, but still not, there, there, there wasn't a significant difference in their primary outcome measure. They found differences, significant differences in a number of other measures, but not the one that listed on the clinical trial application as being the, the primary measure for depression. This, this idea that um, you know, my, most of my work has been being with alcohol and other drug use, and this quote in red comes from one of my colleagues and mentors, Professor Nicole Lee, who says, relapse is the most common outcome of the treatments that we have at the moment. And so this data is from uh, John Hopkins' study, which is an open label trial of psilocybin assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of tobacco addiction. At a six month follow up, 80% of people were no longer smoking. Now, if we compare that with the leading pharmaceutical treatment for, for tobacco addiction, which is Champix, it's just about 25 27% efficacy. So these are incredibly 
um, incredibly impressive results. So this group is now stepping it up like the Imperial group, they're now conducting a randomized control trial to develop further evidence. There's been several studies published now and phase three clinical trials underway looking at the potential for psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to assist people who have been diagnosed with cancer. And effectively allows you to provide dignity. So my, my, my research interest is actually more, more, more focused on MDMA than psychedelics per se, and MDMA is not typically considered a psychedelic. And I tried to be putting one slide, everything about MDMA, that I've just talked about psychedelics. So MDMA um, you know, was being used in psychotherapy in the 70s uh, to treat post-traumatic stress disorder and also to, um, to in, in couples work, very effective um, treatment, in couple, uh, treatment for couples work, as you can imagine. Um, it became popular, like psychedelics, it was banned, and then of course we have all the propaganda that came out um, around ecstasy. And along with it is examples of you know the, the, the hype that's, that's around in these drugs at the moment. So uh, this is from Oprah magazine. Can a single pill heal your past? My answer is probably not. Um, <laughs> uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy over the course of 18 weeks in which there's three doses of MDMA might be helpful, but I'm not sure a single pill can heal your past. So MDMA was banned in uh, 1986, and that same year, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies was established by Rick Doblin as a response to that to try to get this drug recognised as medicine. Um, and pretty much all the, all the research that's happened around the world with regard to MDMA has been sponsored by MAPS. It's a not-for-profit organisation. Um, and they've just completed the first phase three clinical trial of MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD with some really promising results. It hasn't been published yet. It will be published in the next month or two. So rather than, because I can't show you that data, um, I'll show you some data from the very first study that they conducted in 10 years ago now, the first phase three trial. So in this trial, people were given, uh, recruited, and then either assigned to MDMA-assisted psychotherapy or MDMA-assisted psychotherapy where they were given a placebo. And so you can see from the data that, that at the start, people's severity of PTSD symptoms was about the same. But by the first dosing session, there's a significant difference between the MDMA group and the placebo group, and it continues to drop over time. So for two months, Post, post the last dose of MDMA, there's a significant difference between the two groups. Another way of looking at this data is that 83 participants who received MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and not placebo no longer met the diagnostic criteria for PTSD. And these were participants that had not responded to at least two conventional treatments. That was one of the criteria for this first study, first, of the paper, first phase two clinical trial. They followed these people up then three and a half years later on average and found not only was there a decrease in PTSD symptoms, but by the long-term follow-up at around three and a half years later, nobody met treatment criteria. So we've gone from 83% of people to nobody beyond the meeting criteria for PTSD. Following that study, six phase two trials were completed, and if you pull the data together, it found that at 12 month follow up, 68% of participants receiving MDMA assisted psychotherapy no longer met criteria for PTSD. So I've talked a lot about sort of what's happening internationally, and I wanted to bring the focus back to sort of what's happening here in Australia, which would create a bit of a segue to, to Matt's talk. So, in 2011, Rick Doblin from MAPS came to Australia, presented at a conference, and got a group of us together who he, you know, Rick is actually a very charismatic and persuasive fellow. And he said, you know, has to be doing this research in Australia. And so he said, yeah, we can do this research in Australia. And so in 2011, prison was formed. Um, we're a tax-deductible 
uh, we got tested up to the gift recipient status. Uh, board of six directors, four of them are unpaid, including myself, plus some part-time paid directors, including our executive director and a secretary role. We have partnerships with MAPS, USONA, who are the open science source of psilocybin internationally at the moment, and also the Vazadara Foundation. It, it just, uh, I was going to say, uh, our plan this year, but we, this has actually happened, we've now become a non-profit, we've now become a non-profit company limited by guarantee. So, we formed in 2011, full of enthusiasm based on what Rick had told us how we could do this research in Australia. In 2012, we submitted a, a protocol which was very similar to that of the, the protocol that generated the data which I showed you previously. We focused on war veterans strategically because we thought people would, people would have sympathy and, 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 and want to see this treatment offered for people uh, particularly Australian law veterans who have not responded to um, existing treatments. It was submitted to Belbury, which is one of Australia's only independent uh, ethics committee, and it wasn't rejected based on the methodology. It wasn't rejected based on the science. It was rejected because we tried to replicate the MAPS model, which is to use um, private clinics. And they said, for this research to go ahead, it needs to be done with a university partnership or in a hospital. And so in 2015, we submitted a similar protocol to Deakin University, which was vetoed by the Deakin Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, even before it hit the Ethics Committee. Because the Deputy Vice Chancellor said, we're not doing this sort of research at our university. And so in 2017, um, we regrouped. Rick was back in the country and we were basically saying, Rick, you know, you sold us a, you sold us a good story, you love the work you're doing over in, in the US, but we just can't do this in Australia, it's too hard. And Rick said, um, I'll paraphrase, but he basically said, drink some concrete and hard enough. Because it took him 20, he started in 1985, 1986, and it wasn't until 2011 that he was able to get his first data from their clinical trial, and so he persisted. Around 2017, I moved to ECU, but in 2018, I then approached my Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, sent a couple of papers, and Deputy Vice Chancellor said, Why aren't we doing this research in Australia? I said, Awesome, yes, let's do this research in Australia. We're then able to partner with a uh, local hospital in Perth. Um, I wrote myself a couple of notes for this section, which I think I've lost. I mean, <laughs> Um, what are we going to say? So, where are we at? In 20, so 2018, ECU uh, provided support. In late, 20, in late 2018, uh, myself and, the, and my co therapist from Murdoch University went up over to the Netherlands to complete the MAPS training. In between 2018 and 2019, there was a lot of argument around the university lawyers as to how this was going to work in terms of insurance. By 2019, uh, we were able to submit, to, we got permission to submit it to, back to Belbury, that original ethics committee, who then approved it in late 2019. Then it's been a process in 2020 of working through all of the the bits and pieces that comes with running a clinical trial. So when I started this journey, the idea of running a clinical trial seemed quite romantic. <laughs> Not anymore. When people ask me, what, you, what, what are the key skills you need if you want to run psychedelic clinical trials? I say to them, you need to be keen to fill out a lot of electronic paperwork. So since getting ethics, uh, since getting ethics, we've uh, registered with the TGA, so it's, uh, it's, it's uh, got federal approval. Um, we've also got a Schedule 9 permit to, to hold MDMA in Perth, and we're currently working on installing a safe because we have to put the MDMA in a separate safe. It can't be the same safe as the other drugs in the hospital, it has to be its own safe, because it might be a bad influence on the other drugs. <laughs> Once we get safe, can we can import it, and hopefully we will start first Australian clinical trial of um, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Last year, um, my colleagues over east 
at, Mer at Monash University announced they were going to also do an open label trial of MDMA assisted psychotherapy, and they're about 80 months behind us. But they're catching up quickly because I'm working with them and helping them out with everything that I learned in terms of getting through this process to try to get them to the end point quicker. Um, PRISM is also uh, the, the key funder of the psilocybin research at St. Vincent's Hospital. Um, we're also looking at doing research with 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, mindfulness-based research in which therapists are given psilocybin as part of a mindfulness-based retreat, which allows um, psych psychologists, psychiatrists that haven't had the opportunity to have a psychedelic experience to have that psychedelic experience so that they're able to um, you know, work with patients in, in this modality, which we believe, which I believe is it's important to have had that experience to be able to, to work with patients. So that's that's pretty much my story and, and how how what I guess um, we were, where I started in 2011 and, and where, where we're at now, which is very close to getting Australia's first uh, clinical trial of MDMA assisted psychotherapy up and running. Um, and I just, I guess my final point to finish on would just be in terms of all the hype and everything that's, that's going on, is just that these are not, the, these drugs are not panaceas, they, they're not silver bullets, and I, I, I worry that the hype associated with them. Um, <coughs> It's going to bring people disappointment because it's not a single pill that's going to fix everything like the Oprah, Oprah magazine was, was suggesting. Um, it has to occur in the context of um, you know, intention and psychotherapy and some of the other things that, um, that one of our other speakers will talk about. So on that note, I'll hand it over to Matt. So.